faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Hey guys, Jared Moon here and welcome to the Better Humanology podcast. Today we have Scott Carney and he is the author of the book, What Doesn't Kill Us. Pretty awesome things we talk about, cold exposure, Wim Hof breathing, heat acclimation, and all sorts of different things that can make you a better human. And if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend that you do. But what's really cool, I think the coolest thing about this episode is uh, we have a private Facebook group for all of our garage gym athletes and we had a member post that it would be really awesome if I got to interview Scott uh, because he had just read the book and I was like I haven't read that book so step one I got the book step two I reached out to Scott Uh, step three read the book step four interviewed Scott and now it is live officially uh, and I'm super pumped for you guys to listen to it I love that it was 100% listener driven so if you guys have any more recommendations don't hesitate because this interview was absolutely a blast and Scott is very knowledgeable and really shares some great information information with us today so without any further ado here is Scott Carney All right, Scott, I'm super pumped to have you on the Better Humanology podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, it's awesome to be here. Thanks for having me on. So let's get uh, let's get going the right way here. We're going to start off with a fitness challenge, and I'd love for you to give that to everyone listening today. Do you have a fitness challenge for us? Yeah, I do. It's really, really simple. It's take a cold shower, to, although it's summer, so find the cold water where you can turn it all the way down. And when you're there and that sort of shiver inducing feelings are coming on you, relax in it. And that is one of the keys to what we're probably going to be talking a little bit about today is like getting used to that intense stimulus of the cold and then, you know, being comfortable in that. And it's one way to grow resilience. And it's the, 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 the sort of the entry point for, uh, you know, everything I've done uh, in writing uh, the book, What Doesn't Kill Us. I love that challenge. And it is a little more difficult in the summer, but uh, you can still get it done. You, like you said, find it somewhere. Uh, yeah. Where, where do if you you're on the, uh, I'm in Denver. So I've got some mountain streams here yeah. uh, that, that, that are pretty cool. Uh, you know, if you're on the coast, like on the Pacific, you can just jump in because that's usually pretty cold and stay there for a little while. Uh, you know, it's it, the, the Wim Hof training that, that I studied is is definitely easier to do in the winter because because cold is just more easily accessible. Uh, in, in that case, you know, I might be rolling in the snow or, you know, doing, you know, jumping into ice water and things like that. But, you know, you can uh, try it all summer if you can, you know, find some way to, to actually get cold, you know, maybe hang out in the grocery store in your underwear. See if that works. <laughs> yeah, go into the uh, freezer aisle for as long as you can. <laughs> all right. How about a mental toughness challenge? What does mental toughness mean to you? To me? Yeah. Mental toughness really is just going to be anything that pushes someone to overcome some boundary they're not comfortable in overcoming. God, there's so many. Uh, you know, this the, the cold shower thing actually leads into mental toughness, right? But, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's, it, it, it's that mental thing on its own. But, you know, overcoming challenges, doing things that scare you, uh, is important and also relaxing into things that scare you because at some point you realize that fear is, is, is just suffering before it's happened. Uh, so what I would suggest is, is try not to, to actually feel that fear just makes sort of rational, uh, thoughts about it, uh, before you go into it and then worry about the consequences, you know, as they come. I like that. How about a book recommendation? I mean, that's easy. I wrote a book. I wrote a few books, so I'm going to recommend my own. I know it's self-serving, uh, but what doesn't kill us? How freezing water, environmental conditioning, uh, and extreme altitude will renew our lost evolutionary strength. Uh, it's pretty good. There's even an audiobook for it, and uh, and that's what I'd recommend. But if it was something that I didn't write, I'm going to go with uh, this new one, but called a Homo Deus. Uh, a brief history of tomorrow about human evolution and where we are going and where we've come from. It's pretty badass. Yeah, I've uh, I've heard of that book. It's on my list, and 
I always say when when I get more than one recommendation, it gets bumped up my uh, in the queue. You know, I kind of have that that wish list running on Amazon, and if I get two or three, it, okay, jumps to the jumps to the top of the list, and that one's uh, that one's nearing the top now. So thank you, uh, thank you for the recommendation. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so I want to first tell you how this podcast came about. Um, my I have a, a hundreds and hundreds of athletes. Uh, and we have this like online community and we share a lot of different information from training to mental toughness to all sorts of different things. And then um, one one athlete posted in the group that uh, it was a link to your book. And he's like, everyone needs to read this. And Jared, you definitely need to try and have Scott on your show. And uh, and I, I looked at the book. I was familiar with the Wim Hof Method, immediately downloaded the audio uh, audio book on Audible and was just super pumped, and then within uh, a few days reached out to you, uh, and then and now you're on. So that's why we're doing this podcast. And everyone was like chiming in, "Yeah, we absolutely need to have Scott on the podcast." And and I see why now. Having done, uh, I do a really thorough prep before every single podcast. Everything you're about from writing this book to just being an investigative journalist, all this stuff I find very very fascinating. Uh, and I, I just wanted to give you the backstory because uh, I just wanted to know where it was coming from. This is uh, you, you you have a a strong following even in other communities, which is, which is great. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I, it, it's funny. I've become sort of this, um, I've re- really entered the fitness space with this book because I'm, I'm, you know, investigating sort of weird things about human biology, but my background is really sort of hardcore investigative journalism, anything from war zones to organized crime. I, I wrote, you know, my first book was on organ trafficking where I tracked down organ traffickers around the world. Uh, and uh, I wrote another book, uh, which I just re-released called the enlightenment trap about the uh, attainment, you know, trying to attain spiritual perfection and how that can go horribly wrong and end in people dying, uh, and sort of cultic money laundering and, you know, uh, you know, pretty crazy stuff. And so when I, when I got around to write what doesn't kill us, I'm coming from this sort of very sort of intensive, immersive investigative experience. And, you know, I, I started off as someone who, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not an athlete. I'm not sort of like someone really pushing those boundaries uh, physically. I'm somebody who, who pushes sort of intellectual boundaries a lot. And when I heard about this guy named Wim Hof, this, this, he, he's called the ice man. He's a man who, uh, proclaims the ability to control his body temperature at will to control his immune system, uh, you know, and, do some pretty crazy superhuman feats like hanging out uh, in these barren snow covered landscapes in just his underwear, uh, you know, looking happy. Uh, he, he's hiked two thirds of the way up Mount Everest in just his shorts, you know, and no shirt. You know, he's he's a he's an intense guy. And when I first heard about him and probably a lot of your listeners have heard about him. Um, but when I did, I thought he was just bullshit. I thought that he was making these claims of like, you know, gaining essentially superpowers, uh, through sort of the mental hack, maybe meditation, some, some breathing things, uh, and that I thought he was going to get people killed. And I just written a book about how meditation can lead people to doing extreme things that get them killed. And I figured he was just another charlatan. So when I went out to meet him, the project that I thought I was going to be doing was basically, you know, calling him a charlatan, showing the world that this is just another trickster uh, who's out there to get your money. And but what I found is that, you know, I, I went to this snowy training center that he runs in the wilderness of Poland. You know, and at the point I was living in Los Angeles, so I'm coming from this pretty nice, warm, perpetual summer. Uh, I land in Poland and. And as an investigative journalist, I just don't go out there and, you know, lay into people. I first have to give them a chance. And I gave him a chance and I learned his method. And all of a sudden I was doing the things that he could do. You know, I ended up standing out in this snow covered field in the middle of the winter, in the middle of the winter that stopped the Nazi army. And I was like burning up. And I could stay out there for an hour uh, and be, you know, totally fine. Uh, I learned this breathing method, which doubled the amount of pushups that I could do. And it, and, it, and it doubled them while I was holding my breath. So I'm doing, you know, more pushups than I'd ever done and I'm not breathing. Uh, and then I did this other thing where I hiked up a mountain in Poland, you know, not Everest, but a pretty cool mountain. Uh, and, uh, you know, in just a bathing suit. 
and it was about two degrees Fahrenheit outside. I was there for eight hours and I was boiling up the whole way. And so I realized after that week long program in a story that eventually ran in Playboy magazine, uh, I learned that this guy wasn't a charlatan, that he was actually really on to something and I wanted to find out more. So then that sort of started the journey that became the book, What Doesn't Kill Us, that you listen to on Audible. So, so, and, and that's how I ended up here talking to you. And the I epitome think, of my career right here. This is it. <laughs> and, and I think it's uh, very fascinating. And you're, you're 100% correct. So Wim Hof stormed onto the scene, um, at least in, in my circles. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's been a few years now, um, you know, and everyone kind of responded, I think, initially how you did. Like, uh, you know, this guy's a quack or like or maybe he's just a freak. You know, it's something that he can sure. do, but it's not something that can be taught. Uh, mm -hmm. But the more... Uh, you know, you wrote your book, the more I saw other people doing it, and then actually it being backed by some science that I've read, you know, I was like, okay, now this is this is some pretty interesting stuff. And so right. what I, what I want to know is, you went on like, a, initially a debunking journey, and I, I, you're, you're a very professional journalist, so I'm sure you, uh, you know, when you showed up, you did try and keep an open mind about everything. But was it hard for you to make the transition of like, holy shit, this stuff is actually working? Uh, like, were you almost fighting it at one point, or were were you more like, no, this is wow, this is crazy, it's working, and uh, I got yeah. I got to look more into this. Totally, you know, I still fight it. Like, even after I've written the book, I've done it for six years or seven years at this point, point. Uh, and still, when I'm looking up a mountain, right, and I'm about to take off my shirt and just strip down to shorts, I'm like, is this really going to fucking work? <laughs> Every single time. Uh, because it, it still is bananas to me. It's still bizarre that, that, that the body has these abilities. And then I sort of suck it up and I do it. And then I'm like, oh shit, okay, it worked. And, and so, yeah, it's, I think it's always going to be a struggle. And I think I'm always going to have that skepticism in me, but I also like evidence, right? I like seeing things that actually do work. And I like, you know, and, and it, there's no denying, you know, when, when I started this, I, I mentioned how I doubled the pushups that I could do. Uh, and I also had the caveat that I wasn't an athlete. I'm going to hone that in here. I could do about 20, you know, normal high school style pushups uh, when I started this, this project, you know, that was just where about I topped out, nothing special at all. Um, and when I did his breathing method, you know, which is basically hyperventilating and then holding your breath with no air in your lungs. So you end on an out and you hyperventilate and hold your breath and hyperventilate and hold your breath. And, and I'm noticing that every time I hold my breath, I'm able to hold it longer and longer and longer. And I think at that point I was getting into about two minutes, two and a half minutes of just uh, holding my breath. Uh, and then you do push-ups after doing these repetitions and you know, having no built, no additional muscle. Um, I did 40 push-ups with no air in my lungs, not breathing. And, and there's no denying that, right? I mean, that's just a number <laughs> that, that I, that I, I realized. So, so I doubled this physical activity, uh, by just doing a breathing method. And that is just undeniable. And I knew I had to investigate more. Now, obviously, I can do a lot more than that. Uh, you know, I can hit 80 push-ups uh, without breathing sort of in, in one rep now. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's so eye opening to, to see that performance change so markedly. And now what some real athletes are doing, like people like Brian McKenzie, people like Laird Hamilton, the legendary surfer, they're using that little bump you get uh, with this breathing method and then mixing that with high intensity interval training and finding that they can they can actually train at higher intensities than they could usually do and and, and are really getting amazing results uh, with these breathing protocols. So. You know, it, it, the wonderful thing about the Wim Hof method is that it's now it's not just his anymore. Right. He did. Wim didn't patent breathing. He didn't patent the ice. Right. He, he it, it's now being taken by different people around and it's growing and it's becoming something all on its own. And that's just really exciting. You know, it's something I, I think I was watching one of your TED TED talks uh, mm -hmm. and Something I, th I found very interesting and I 100% agree with is you were like, uh, you know, people tend to think of this calorie in, calorie out fitness, like doing your movements and then also nutrition uh, mm -hmm. type base. And then you were like, there's really this third element, this environmental stimulus, you know, really uh, connecting the by the mind with the body, um, you know, to, to push your perceived limitations. Um, and I, I want to know if are you 
as far as the environment goes, are do you think people should only do cold exposure? Do you think, uh, you know, mm-hmm. you should be in different environmental situations, pushing yourself? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to get your take because I, I have a very strong opinion sure. about it. Um, and I would just sure. like to know where you stand. Sure. Well, so the idea is that that there are three pillars to human to, to fitness, right? And we've always known about diet and exercise. Like that's, you know, we we get that. We've read diet books, we've read exercise books, and we know what's going on with that. What I'm suggesting in this book is that the environment is a vital third category, and and most of us don't pay attention to it because we live at essentially 72 degrees winter or summer, right? We have climate control that keeps us in this very comfortable state. And we just don't think about that as what impact that has on our biology. But we were designed, not designed, I always use that word, that's wrong. We evolved to change, right? We evolved in environments that were constantly varying, either burning heat in the desert or uh, hiking across mountains with barely any um, you know technology, nothing like North Face and, like, and snow boots, right? We had fur skins and, and leather foot bindings. And, and, and our bodies were always having to adapt to that environment uh, and, in order to let us survive. And so what I'm suggesting in the book is that, th- is that we expose ourselves to a wide variety of environments. And now the cold is particularly useful to train in because your body has some very obvious uh, and semi-conscious responses to the cold. So when you jump in, in like say ice water, you're gonna clench up, all of your muscles are gonna sort of squeeze or you're gonna shiver. And, And that's one way to mechanically heat up your body. But you have some mental power over how your body responds. You can actually stop shivering if you say, if you just basically tell yourself don't shiver anymore and, and you resist it just like you would a sneeze or being tickled by someone, right? You can stop that shiver from happening. And so there, there's like this, this contact point where you can train consciously in the cold, which is very useful for what I'm talking about in the book with one of these concepts that we can get to later called the wedge. However, all environmental uh, inputs are important. Uh, you know, heat is very important, like how you respond to that heat and getting used to that heat is, is critical. Altitude, going high or low, water pressure, you're like if you're in, you know, even uh, even a bathtub actually, um, uh, exerts certain stimulus that your nerves respond to and then change things in your inner biology. So what I'm uh, advocating is getting out there and letting your skin sense the planet you know, sense the environment around you and let your body sort of figure out what to do with that stimulus. Uh, And, and the reason why we focus on the cold with the Wim Hof method is because it's, it's very, it's a very strong signal, but it's not the only signal. Yeah, that's, uh, I I just really want to hit on that because I'm a huge advocate of training outside. I mean, I, I train five or six days a week, have for uh, probably a decade and a half. And for the last decade, I could probably count on one hand how many times I've been inside. Uh, I'm, oh, awesome. I, I'm always outside uh, in my garage or, or outside trying to use the elements. But uh, I live in Dallas, Texas. And so in the summer, oh, shit. <laughs> I, in the summer, I get some extreme heat exposure, uh, mm-hmm. almost to a ridiculous degree. And then in the winter, Um, it doesn't get super cold here, but I I utilize that to the best of my ability. And Mm. it's something I've always initially when I was, like I said, been doing this for a long time, I was only really focusing on kind of, uh, we touched on at the beginning, mental toughness, the mental toughness that it can help a person, uh, you know, gain through just being a little bit more uncomfortable and getting comfortable with that fact. And now, like you're putting together great information. And and so is so a lot of other people about uh, the actual, you know, science behind why that stuff matters and how it can actually make us better. And I, I find that extremely uh, fascinating. Now, I want to... So back- I, have a, I have a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Let's, so you say you train outdoors in Houston, which is hot. Dallas, Dallas, yeah. Oh, sorry, in Dallas, which is hot, right? That's what, Texas is freaking hot. How do you deal with the heat when you're sort of on a really hard workout, you're in the sun? What, what is it that you do to, to sort of keep yourself on track you know i think to be honest uh because you know i've done some extreme cold exposure too and you're talking about like suppressing that shivering um and and all those things with heat i feel like you have to take a way more gradual approach and this this may be something you do with cold as well but uh just slow acclimation and slow intensity build over time now anything i do in particular uh 
would really just be to you know focus on my breathing and be aware of how I'm feeling uh you know that it's not so much I don't really have any techniques or strategies it's more just trying to stay safe as possible but uh, I like to extend the exposure as as long as possible as well have you ever gotten uh, heat stroke uh, I've had I had one pretty bad case of I'd say heat exhaustion nearing heat stroke um and it was several years ago I was here in Dallas I did a track workout I was by myself uh, just doing these extreme sprints and uh, could barely make it back to my car, uh, ma- made it back to my car to drive to a gas station that was like a mile away. And then I op- right. opened their fridge and got inside of it and, <laughs> oh, shit. and just sat there and drank a Gatorade for like 30 minutes. And no one even talked to me or like anything. I just sat there, I kind of recovered, right. picked myself back up and, and went on. But oh, that was the man. only time. Um, right. And since I know what that feeling is, it's like a it's a blessing and a curse, if you will, because now I know what it's like, and I I can push myself in extreme temperature for a long period of time in the heat. Uh, but you I know where that is. But I know yeah. I know where I need to draw the line too. Right. Yeah. I mean, see, this is the this is the problem with with heat is that is that it can also sneak up on you, and then it, the crash is debilitating. Uh, and and this is the this is the the. You know, I'm investigating now. I'm, I'm writing another book uh, where I'm looking at all sorts of environmental inputs. And I'm I really want to talk about the heat, but I also am afraid of it because of the potential dangers uh, of heat stroke, because it's a lot easier to warm yourself up from being too cold than it is to bring yourself down. So it requires almost what you had, like experiencing the heat stroke. So you just know you don't get to that point, but you don't know that point until you've hit it. So it's tricky. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say one of the warning signs, the earliest warning signs I can detect now is if I'm feeling almost feverish to like, right. uh, like if I'm starting, if I'm starting to get cold and it's a hundred, oh, the, 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 the feels, fascinating. The feels like temperature is 120 degrees outside. I'm feeling a little bit hot, obviously, but then I, it transitions to almost like a chill and a cold. And I'm like, oh shit, I got to get inside, you know? Oh, okay. That, so that, that's one al- alarm there that I notice now. And it's probably, really, it's only probably happened to me one or two times in the last couple of years. Um, when I've been really pushing it to, because I take like, uh, just this is the last thing. And then I'd like to ask you one other question about the, the Wim Hof method, but, uh, I did it two years ago and I'm doing it again this year. It's called the hotter in hell hundred. It's a hundred mile, hundred mile bike race up in Wichita falls. And the temperatures are, are really insane. And the bike race takes anywhere from six to eight hours, given that I'm not a cyclist at, by any means. And so it takes me a long mm-hmm. time. Um, and, right. so, and so that's, the only thing I do to train for that is not ride a bike. All I do is spend as much time as I can outside uh, to make sure that I'm acclimated to that heat because that's the the scariest factor in doing a race like that. It's not oh, necessarily, sure. you know, pushing the pedals around. I, you know, that's that's different. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's a lot of fun uh, and embracing the environment as much as you can. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the winter, I'll I'll work out uh, here in Denver and just wear a, a you know a bathing suit and running shoes and I'll run around the lakes uh you know in in the town and and the the point of that is is more about the cold exposure more about the exposure to the environment than it is my performance uh running uh it's just like using that environment feeling it and then being like this is not something that you think you should be doing but you can do it and then it makes you stronger internally so and I want to go back to the Wim Hof method, just in case anyone listening is not real familiar. And you don't have to do a super in-depth, deep dive of what it is, but maybe you could just give an explanation of the different components. Um, and I'm also curious because my only uh, interaction with the Wim Hof method is, I've, I've read a lot about it online. I got the Inner Fire app uh, from Wim, Wim Hof and his team and stuff, but I just want to know if there are any kind of differences or variations having learned from the master himself, you know, uh, Wim Hof uh, and, and how you do it. So there, it, it consists of two components, right? The, 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 and they don't need to be done at the same time. Some people make this mistake and they say you do it temporally at the same moment. But they're, they're, they're two separate things that then train your biology to work together at, at later points. And, and it's a breathing method and cold exposure. And, and, and the breathing method is uh, essentially uh, fast, deep, breaths. So about 30 of them, and they'll sound like this. (gasps) 
that are full lung breaths, you know, uh, you can vary it a little bit. You can go to your belly first, then, then your lungs and then out your mouth or nose. It, it doesn't actually really matter as long as you're, uh, creating a gas exchange and, and, uh, blowing off CO2 and getting a lot of, uh, additional oxygen into your blood. It doesn't matter, but it's about that pace and you do 30 of them. And at the end you let all of the air out of your lungs. So just a big exhale, like, and then you hold it for as long as you can. And, and, you know, usually it's not going to be that impressive. Maybe it's a minute is what you can hold at that point. And then you do another rep of that. Um, you just immediately go into it and then you do, you know, 30 breaths, uh, uh, exhale and hold it again. And you're going to notice now that you can hold your breath a lot longer than you did that first rep. Uh, usually I'll do two minutes on the second rep. Uh, and then you, you do it a, th a third time and you've got, uh, and then you hold your breath again. And usually I'll hold my breath for then three minutes and, and then I'll do a, a fourth rep. And then at the end of that, I'll do breath out pushups where, where I'll do the breathing, let all the air out of my lungs and just start doing pushups and see how many I can do. That is the morning basic routine for the Wim Hof method. You don't need to go download the video course to learn it. It just, you know, you can just look at a YouTube video and you'll, you'll, you'll figure it out. And so what you're doing in this is you're learning to uh, expand the amount. You, basically, you're, you're working on the gas, the gasp reflex, you know, that moment where you feel like you have to breathe and you're pushing it farther and farther away so that, it, you know, you could hold your breath for sort of incredibly long periods of time. And the reason you're doing that is because you're trying to interact with the autonomic functions of your body. These are the things that don't usually have conscious uh, you don't have conscious control over. These are things like your heart rate, the like vasoconstriction, which is where the veins in your bot in your uh, extremities expand and contract. Uh, and and the gasp point is one of these things that is is both autonomic and somatic. So so it's something that's that that's both under the, your conscious control and your autonomic control. You're just trying to push it, push that needle to, more towards conscious. And, and the more you do that, the more, the just deeper you get into your physiology. So that's the basic morning workout for that. And then at a separate point, it's getting cold. It's exposing yourself to cold, either in a shower, uh, you know, you start hot and then just turn it all the way cold or jumping into ice water, rolling into snow, you know, uh, you know, getting into your grocery store freezer. I don't care how you do it. Um, but you're supposed to have your skin out to this cold. And, and what you do is you suppress your urge to shiver and clench. And, and, and the, the autonomic response is to warm yourself with that, the action of your muscles. And what you're doing instead is telling your body, no, I'm not gonna shiver. You're gonna have to find a different way to heat yourself. And what happens is your body says, okay, I don't wanna die, I'm cold. So then it starts using its metabolism to warm yourself up. And so you've actually, and, and what it will do is we'll, it'll start uh, burning white fat instead of using a uh, sort of caloric energy and you'll, 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 you go immediately to a sort of a fat burning state if you can do that. Uh, and if you do it for long enough, you actually lose weight. That's pretty cool. Uh, so those are the two basic parts of the Wim Hof method. That's what you would learn in the 10 week course that, that he charges like 200 bucks for or whatever it is. But it's just those two principles that then you expand into, you know, all sorts of other ways uh, you start using that delayed shiver response and, and you keep your, your, your mind, at that mental point that stops the shiver from happening. Then you take that outside and you hike up a mountain in your bathing suit and you suddenly find that you're warm all the way to the top. Uh, it, it's, it's really quite powerful, even though it sounds like almost stupidly simple. It is very simple. Uh, is this something that you've continued on? You're still doing up to today? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, sometimes you fall on and off. I think with, and this is, you know, something that you mentioned to me before this podcast started is that, that maintaining routines can be difficult. Uh, and, and so sometimes what will happen is I'll, I'll be doing daily practice for like six months and then I miss a week cause I'm on vacation or something. And then it's, it's hard to get uh, back on track. And I just came back from vacation. So I haven't done the breathing for, uh, two or three weeks. So I need to get back on track. I need to take a hint back from you, but yeah, it's something that I've done pretty consistently for about seven years. Okay. That's, that's, uh, some serious data points right there. 
Uh, and so let's talk about you climbing Mount Kilimanjaro because that's a big part of the book and it's pretty awesome. But one thing I want to know, and, and I think the listeners would want to know, uh, so you, you practice this, the, the breathing and cold exposure. And then was it before you climb the mountain, you really, you just do that one more time and then, and then head on up. Is that, uh, is that the practice for, for putting the, the method into place to be able to do something like climb Mount Kilimanjaro? So the, the mountain thing for the, for the people who haven't read the book, you know, I, I sort of end it with after doing, you know, this training for off and on, I think for about six years at that point, uh, I wanted to put myself on a real challenge. And, and the challenge was I got to go up Mount Kilimanjaro, which is the highest mountain in Africa. And we were just going to be in our shorts, you know, just, you know, shirtless with shoes on and a hat, uh, and, getting to the top of the mountain, not only resisting cold, but we were also um, trying to do it at, at, at what Wim said was a record pace, uh, which is actually not a, an actual record. It's a, it's a record that he made up in his mind, but it was nonetheless uh, ridiculously fast. We, we, got, we were aimed to get up the mountain in 30 hours, uh, where usually it takes about five days to get to the top, not because Mount Kilimanjaro is difficult. It's, it's basically a hike with some sort of you know, more moderate uh, to difficult parts in it. But it's because the altitude change uh, means that normally you have to, you know, go up a few hundred, you know, a few thousand feet, and then you have to stop for hours and hours and hours to let your blood uh, acclimatize and, you know, get new red blood cells before you go up. So you take about five days to get to the top of Kili. Um, We wanted to sprint back basically to the top and do it in 30 hours. And, when we told some mountaineering groups uh, if what would happen, there were 30 of us on this on this challenge. Uh, the Dutch Mountaineering Association said we would all die. <laughs> the, the U.S. military, uh, you know, I, I talked to their environmental unit, said 70 percent of us would come down with acute mountain sickness, which is this debilitating and potentially fatal um, situation where essentially your blood doesn't have enough oxygen and you, you know, just sort of collapse and have a heart attack. Uh, or your your lungs will fill up with uh, with fluid. Very dangerous um, condition. The only way to to treat is actually to lower in altitude. Uh, even at the five day uh, ascent speed, uh, Kilimanjaro only has about a sixty percent success rate. And it's not because of the difficulty of the mountain; it's because of the altitude change. Now, what we were doing is to compensate for that decreased oxygen. Is we did a modified version of the breathing method. Uh, which was basically that um, we breathe like that constantly. There were no breath retentions. Uh, we just breathe like that constantly for the entire duration of the ascent. Uh, and in, in, in doing that, we were compensating for the decreased uh, O2 saturation in the atmosphere. And that's what allowed uh, almost all of us not to get uh, any of these, these, uh, um, uh, and not to get any of that AMS condition. Like we, we, none of, no one had serious, no, no, we had one person come down, two people come down with serious uh, AMS who had to be, had to go down, but everyone else made it up to the top, which was, a, you know, a huge success and, and, and very unexpected by the medical people I talked to beforehand. That's incredible. And that's just primarily through that additional O2 saturation that kept you guys going, right? Well, Mm-hmm. And, and, what, and we'd and we'd all been doing the Wim Hof method for years before this. Like no one, no one went in there with with no training. So uh, I, I don't know if if somebody who's not accustomed to doing that breathing every morning with the breath retentions, if they did it just blind, if it would be um, useful for them because they might not be able to keep up that uh, that level of intensity. Because you know, you, if you're hyperventilating, that you're going to get dizzy. You're going to uh, you know, you might fall down. There's all sorts of, of things that that can go wrong. But we had sort of trained our bodies to deal with that, that, you know, the, the difficult parts of hyperventilation, um, uh, uh, you know, for years beforehand. Uh, can you talk to me about the wedge? Right. So the wedge is the main idea that I'm, I'm, I'm pushing in, not pushing that I'm that I'm trying to explain in this book, which is there's this point with in in our bodies uh, this this interface between where your conscious mind affects your your sort of biological autonomic stuff, and that 
in, and sometimes you have the ability to gain more control over unconscious processes than not. And the classic example is, of course, the breath, right? If you stop thinking about breathing, uh, you will continue breathing. You're not going to die. We're not whales who have to consciously breathe all the time. But you can instantly and, and you know, I can't even explain how we do it, right? You can just say, okay, I'm not going to breathe or I'm going to breathe faster or I can just take complete control over that physical process. And that is what I call the wedge in a way, right? That, that when you say, okay, I'm going to, 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 to move the conscious control over uh, is, is where you're sort of uh, strengthening your mind over your body. Now, what's cool is that you can move the wedge from something that's sort of obvious like breathing into other parts of your body. You know, you can use it to, as I mentioned before, stop shivering. And by stopping shivering, you actually turn on a metabolic process. You can do it in the heat by, you know, you, what, what some people call grit or what I think what you use call mental toughness. You can say, okay, I'm gonna push a little bit harder in this even though my body says stop, I can push it farther to find what my real limits are. Uh, you can use it in, uh, you know, you could use it theoretically to stop peeing, right? You know, you have to, you, you want to pee and you can just delay it and, you know, until you get to a bathroom. That's also the wedge. You can use it to delay sneezing. Like if you have an allergy attack, you can say, I don't want to sneeze. And you can stop that from happening. And there's all these like cystic, like reflexes in the body that are triggered by external um stimuli that you can then use your mind to counteract. And, and the wedge is like really beautifully explained in the cold. And what I'm trying to do now, what actually the next project that I'm working on is, is to see where else we can ex expand conscious control over autonomic processes. And I don't really know how far it can go. I think that there's you know, quite a few external stimulus that we can we can tweak uh, uh, with a conscious component to take control of our inner biology. And that's sort of this next sort of mission uh, that I'm on right now. And it will probably be a book in the next couple of years. I think that's an that's an awesome journey that you're going down because I'm a, you know, huge believer in basically what you're saying that. And I, I even think that a lot of what Wim Hof has found, uh, you know, over his entire career, if you want to say, is being able to control the immune system. And, uh, you know, you know about the study that, where they he taught uh, individuals to basically suppress uh, their immune response, their immune response yeah. to a toxin when they were injected with it. And I really feel like we are just at the tip of the iceberg here uh, mm -hmm. because, yeah, it wasn't that long ago when they were like, you can't control your immune system. And, and if you think if that were to be honed even further and further and further to the human mind, being able to uh, do particular things that you need it to uh, in your right. body with the immune system, that gets really, really powerful. And so are you kind of in the research stage or are you looking at any particular things right now um, right. that we can, we can take over? Well, I'm just I'm just starting the research on this. And honestly, it is a wide and vast field. And I don't have like a guru to follow now. Right. I don't have like some mastermind who's like figured it all out, which was the fun thing about following Wim Hof on his journey. Uh, I'm sort of out here on my own at the moment. And, you know, I wouldn't say totally on my own because there's obviously people who are looking at, at different parts of this already. Uh, and if people, if you want to go look at some people, I would say Brian McKenzie and Casper Vandermullen are some, some of my, uh, you know, heroes in this, in this genre. Uh, but you know, I want to look at any place where the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system meet. And the, 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 so sympathetic is the fight or flight response. You know, you see a tiger, you want to run or beat it up. I was just running. Um, or, or, and, and the, the parasympathetic is sort of the, the rest digest, uh, um, part of things. And, and, and that's sort of like your unconscious body's response, but you still have some mental control over it. So I'm, I'm trying to look at ways to control, say, uh, adrenaline release or control possibly melatonin, which is one of the sleep um, uh, hormones that comes out. Uh, I want to look at fear. I want to look at hunger. I want to look at sex. I want to look at um, uh, hot uh, heat and cold, maybe anger and addiction. I don't if that will work, but I'm, I'm just very much on the exploratory side of this. And I also am starting to get interested in things like 
uh, like psychedelics, like, you know, that, that they, they create this sort of mental state where things change and where you're, you're suddenly in a neuroplastic state. And, and can you use that external stimulus to come up with beneficial things on the other end? And I'm at this point, 50, 50 on that. I think sometimes yes. And sometimes no. Uh, and, and then it's sort of, and, and the, and then the furthest part, that I'm looking at are things that are totally synthetic. Like what would happen if you looked at uh, electricity or, or, or um, you know, things that, that, that were, or total sensory deprivation, like how do those things interact on the mind and can those be used to change the way your body functions? And this is just what I'm thinking today. Tomorrow, all of these things could change because I'm just in the outline stage, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. Yeah. And then the, a big, part of the the battle between the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system is measured right now uh through heart rate variability um which mm -hmm. i'm sure that you've stumbled on in your research i'd mm -hmm. want i'd be curious to find if you could find someone who can at will control their heart rate variability not just their heart rate because i know that's been done i've read that in books before uh i think the book mm -hmm. stealing fire they talk about that um sure uh, it's so, pretty easy to lower your heart rate right you know, um um, but but so heart rate variability. Now, how does that work? What would what would be the output for you in measuring that? Uh, so you can. There are a lot of devices out there now that can to measure your heart rate variability, and that's you know the how much your heart rate varies between beats um, and how many ever milliseconds that is. And uh, you actually to and, and there's a lot of research in the medical field is where it started because. Uh, people with a higher heart rate variability were less likely to have heart disease. And then going further down into that, they, they found that athletes um, who have athletes tend to have a higher heart rate variability. Um, and it, but it's also a measure for an athlete now in recovery. So if I wake up this morning and my heart rate variability is very low, then or or my heartbeats are consistent which is actually a bad thing if it's very low then my recovery is low and I need to think about um, what my training should be that day. Now, the next day, if my heart rate variability is off the charts, super high, my body is primed and peaked to take on more performance. Now, this is something I've been doing for several months uh, because it's something I've been tracking for several months because I want to um, not necessarily at will. That's not, I, I haven't gotten to a stage where I want to be at will, be able to control my heart rate variability, but mm -hmm. increase my heart rate variability as much as I can through things like, uh, breathing methods that I'm doing, uh, nutrition, hydration, um, stress reduction, all of these things help improve your heart rate variability. It's, it's a really a whole person concept, but that's something I've been spending a lot of time on. And I think, and that's basically all my research on it has, it comes down to your heart rate variability is actually just a, a struggle, a battle between your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, uh, you know, battling each other. One of them wants to go do stuff and be crazy. The other ones, like, hey, chill out, uh, you know, and, and uh, that's that's where the heart rate variability actually comes into play. So what you're saying is it's 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 if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, it's that your heart rate, you know, instead of just beating, it would be better to be. I mean, something like that. Yeah, and it's it's milliseconds, so it's uh, right, right, right. Not not obviously not as exact right. as what I just did. That's yeah, and probably. so the the more. <laughs> The more variation that you have, uh, and, and that's kind of contrary to some people's thought process. So the more variation, the better, um, is you want a higher heart rate variability in between beats. Because if you had a, obviously a, a 60 beats per minute, just sitting down, um, most people would think that it's just your heart is beating once every second. When in all reality, it's speeding at uh, 0.8 milliseconds, uh, 1.2 milliseconds. It's just, it's bouncing all over the place because uh, you're not a machine, you know? And, uh, right. and and then they, like I said, all this research stemming from uh, people with heart uh, heart disease and like, you know, predicting how long right. they would live. And right. and like I said, all this uh, transitioning into athletes has been huge. And, and it's helped my training a ton because I, I know when to when to back off or, or when to really, right. really push it. And so 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 it's so basically, uh, I, I would guess that a very regular heart rate would be your parasympathetic nervous system, um, you know, uh, having control and a, and a more variable heart rate would be more your sympathetic nervous system. Is that is that am I understanding you right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you don't want the uh, parasympathetic to win, basically. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, but, I, but it's I, definitely you know, that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to incorporate this in my book. It sounds like uh, I could do some stuff with that. Yeah, it's a, it's very interesting stuff, and uh, 
a good device to check out that I've been using to help track this. Uh, it's called the Whoop. If you want to check that out, the Whoop. Uh, yeah, W O O P. W H O O P. There are a lot of de- devices out there that uh, record your um, heart rate variability. That one's just uh-huh. been, and I've tried basically all of them. That one's just been the easiest for me because it just takes it while you're sleeping, so you wake up, you know, what your heart rate variability is, and I don't have to like sit down and like try and relax and like take because that's how a lot of the other ones work. Um, so. Yeah. Oh, all right. All right, Whoop. man. Found it. I'm going to check it out. Awesome. So I want to ask you what we call the book question. Um, sure. So say there's a nationwide curriculum implemented and the president calls you up and says you're responsible for one chapter of the book. So every single child in America will have to read your chapter and be tested on and pass before they can graduate high school. Uh, what would your chapter be about? Oh, my God. Wait, you said this was on fitness or just in general? No, in general, it could be about anything. Oh, my God. That's so hard. The, I, I, our education system is so messed up as is. What could I teach the world? Uh, I mean, critical thinking skills, I think, are very important. Um, trying to suss out what is bullshit and what is um, truth, I think, is what the world needs at the moment more than anything. And I think one of the problems on the planet, uh, especially in the last like two or three years, is that we're always looking at lies. Right. And, and we're and, and we're we're. It's hard to find or, or to even identify what a good source is. And we look at places like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. We call them fake news. CNN, we call it fake news. And we're not understanding um, that 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 constructed reason uh, and, and, and constructed lies are a very different thing than, uh, you know, sort of people who are trying to to you know get the facts and, and 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 at least approach objectivity and i think that we've become a very cynical nation so i think you know on a political level i would say i trying to be skeptical of lies but also uh alternately embrace what is actually fact and what what, what people where people are trying to do their best efforts and i think that's that would be what I think the world needs right now, if I was going to say something about my own research, I would say pay attention to your body and and listen to what your biology is doing and and don't ignore it. Uh, I think that's that that would be my chapter's going to be weird, man. I'm sorry. I, I hey, it's I've had uh, you know like world class doctors of physical therapy tell me that their their chapter would be about. Uh, personal finance you know so it's uh oh it, yeah i dig that too yeah i could do a finance chapter as well <laughs> yeah exactly like it's just uh and, negotiate your contracts that's that's also important <laughs> and I, I love to hear it too as someone uh i i have two young boys and uh, you know i just love to hear what all these experts are saying you know if they could help shape future generations what they would uh write their chapter about and it's uh, you know i'm normally or i'd say every time so far i've been in complete agreement with uh you know the chapters i think they're all they're all great, and uh, I always joke that I need to write this book, but I have to steal everyone's ideas to do it. Uh, yeah, that, that's what that's what all great authors do. Right? Do. Yeah. <laughs> all right, man, so uh, I'm going to move on to the quick-fire questions of the show. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. All right, what's the hardest workout you've ever done? The hardest workout I've ever done was a HIT training with uh, Brian McKenzie, where he put me on one of those assault bikes, and I was alternating it with uh, the Wim Hof breathing, and it kicked my ass, and I wanted to die at the end of it. That's awesome. Anything with Brian is normally uh, pretty fun. Yeah, absolutely. All right. In your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Just living life, man. Just taking, uh, going after challenges. I mean, I think that there's always, uh, uh, you know, just turning away from comfort. There's always opportunities to build grit and to go out there and try things that are hard. And it doesn't have to be physical, but it can be physical. Uh, it, it's basically not being comfortable. Uh, that, that is the, that is where mental toughness goes in is saying, you know, not getting stuck in your routines and in a way, probably escaping the ordinary humdrum of life where you are comfortable, just moving to a more uncomfortable place is probably the hardest routine. You know, it's one thing to do a three hour workout and, and bust your balls because that's contained. It, it's a much harder challenge to get in the moment, every moment and try to be present. That's probably the most difficult piece of mental toughness out there. You know, I had this conversation with a sports psychologist recently about how, uh, so mental toughness, uh, for me, because I, like we talked about, I, I work out, um, outside all the time. I, I do cold showers, um, when they 
when they can, especially like all throughout the winter. Uh, I work out, push myself really hard. But to be honest, none of those things really, um, other than like a, by marginal percentages, are helping me improve my my grit that much uh, because they've become so uh, routine. Yeah, and so things that push me, uh, you know. Are, are way more on like, uh, you know, social levels and uh, getting in uncomfortable situations and conversations and different things like that. So it's always, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's different for everybody. And, I, and that's why I love getting everyone's uh, opinion on it. Um, cause it kind of, and I think you had a, an amazing answer for getting out of your, your contained life and, and, and pushing yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing that I've been looking at a lot lately is this idea of neuroplasticity, which is, is, is the mo is the, the, the brain state where you start forming new neural connections. And, and it's, a, it's a place that children are all the time. And they're able to, you know, this is why children learn so much, right? It's because their brains are plastic. And as we get older, our brains generally are less plastic. But there's an emotional side to plasticity that I'm, um, I'm only starting to realize, which is the idea of novelness. If, you, if children look at the world as fundamentally new, and when they see things as new, that's when they're learning. So the, the sensation of neuroplasticity, I believe, is that sense of possibility, that sense of newness. And when you get sort of jaded and you don't see things as new anymore, you're no longer in a plastic state. So if you can get yourself to a point where things seem new again, where, where you can find the newness in it, I believe that is pushing you to a point where where things are, you know, where you have the ability to learn and the ability to change old habits. And I think that's probably going to be the hardest challenge as I push forward in my book is to to realize that that ruts are ruts and and that 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 we can push ourselves to find newness, even in things that that are seemingly ordinary. It's so interesting. I had a Dr. Leslie Sherlin on the podcast, and he's uh, a big researcher into neuroplasticity. And I, mm-hmm. I, I was trying to drill it down to them because he's like, I mean, he is huge. High level. Yeah, like intellectual, <laughs> like, you know, really. I was like, come on, let's get practical, practical, practical. Like, how how can we do it? And uh, kind of what you were saying, that newness is, he's like, okay, on a daily basis, you just go to new places, new things. Like, uh, put your, like, he, he's not even like, push, like, if you work at your house every single day, like, go to a coffee shop, then go to a different coffee shop, then go to a, somewhere else. And he's like, that is probably the easiest way to increase your neuroplasticity. But I've never had when someone explain it as simply as you did is just kind of like look for the newness. And uh, that, that, that'll be perfect. I think that's great, man. Yeah. And I don't even think you need to go to different places. I mean, I think that helps because obviously change leads, you know, environmental change leads to novelness for sure. But I think, you know, if you think about the the most advanced uh, yogis and meditation practitioners, they can sit in a cave for, uh, you know, years, some of them, uh, where where there's no new stimuli, but they're able to find that in themselves. Like they're able to to find that, that, um, that newness in the utterly ordinary where they're and and if you you study you know longtime meditators brains you find that they are highly plastic so i you know i'm not there yet you know i'm i'm not you know, a 20 year meditator or anything like that but i think that they're that that i'm i'm just beginning to understand that that we can try to in our ordinary moments find new experiences and once you do that i think that that that's going to be one of the keys to um you know happiness to to fulfillment to all sorts of 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 things that we that we all want to achieve all right scott are you ready for the question let's do it what is your best advice you have for becoming a better human this is 100 percent open-ended I think I just answered that, man. I, I, I'm ahead of your question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ahead because, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, finding the, the extraordinary in, in every day and, and also, you know, being skeptical of bullshit. I think that, that I've hit on a lot of these, these points. And, and, you know, I think that the key to being a good person is trying to be a good person, right? You know, whatever that means for you, because everyone's situation is different. All the, the things around us are different. I don't live your life. You don't live my life. And, and, but, but in every moment you can make the best decision you can. Uh, and, and I, I think trying is better than not trying and, and actually grappling with, with gray areas is important. And, 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 you know, helps us fulfill ourselves. So, yeah, do good. How's that sound? Sounds perfect. 
All right, Scott, I couldn't be happier that you know my athletes uh, turned me on to you and your work and the fact that we're having this conversation. Uh, I just it's been phenomenal. It's been a great time having you on the podcast. And we've mentioned your books a few times, but I, I'd love to give you an opportunity here at the end to just uh, point penny, people in any direction you'd like uh, them to go, uh, where they can sure. check out your your work and everything else. So I'm going to suggest two of the books because I've got a, I got a ton of books that I've, I've got out. But one is is What Doesn't Kill Us, and that's mostly what we were talked about today. It's out in audiobook. It's in a hardcover uh, Kindle, all that, all that stuff and is what doesn't kill us, how freezing water, extreme altitude, environmental conditioning will renew our lost evolutionary strength. And it's really about how, you know, all the beauty and wonder that we have in our human body. But I also want to plug another book that I just released last week that we didn't talk about. Um, but it's pretty cool. It's called the enlightenment trap, uh, obsession, mad, madness and death on diamond mountain which is a re-release re of another book that i of, that i released earlier but I, I finally got it in the form i wanted and it's about the it's the opposite of what doesn't kill us it's about how pursuit of the uh, unnatural and superhuman can lead you down a very dark and mysterious path and when you read these two books together you understand how great what what wim hof is doing and where the potential dangers of what he's doing can go. So they, they really need to be read together to really understand the full message that I'm trying to put forward here. So the enlightenment trap and what doesn't kill us. And I'm going to put that one on my list right now because I had, I saw that book uh, when I was doing the the research for this and I would just I didn't ask you any questions about today because uh, I just hadn't read it yet. I wasn't very informed on it, but uh, it looks fascinating. Maybe I can read that one. We can have you back on, but uh, it's Love been, it. Let's do it. Let's do it, man. All right. It's been great. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's been a blast. All right. Thanks a lot, man. Have a great day. Losers always whine about their best. <laughs>